Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. I'm Trevor Burrus. Joining us today is Jesse Walker. He's book's editor of Reason Magazine. He has written on topics ranging from pirate radio to copyright law to political paranoia, and he is author of the books Rebels on the Air, An Alternative History of Radio in America, and The United States of Paranoia, A Conspiracy Theory. Before we get to the meat of the book and your theories about conspiracy theories, how did you get into this topic in the first place? Yeah, well, it's been an ongoing interest going back to my teens in a couple of different ways. Um, the story I, I usually tell when people ask me that is just that I, I got interested in um, the, uh, the, the the stories that came out in the mid nineteen seventies, the Church Committee investigations, and, and so on, of the uh, real misdeeds of the CIA and the FBI and IRS and so forth, and that while I was um, Looking for books on that, I often found other books on the same shelf whose uh, whose claims weren't quite as well grounded, um, but which nonetheless were engaging to read. Um, and so I got interested in um, both the you know actual covert action, the history of actual covert action, and the history of the stories that people tell about covert action, um, and the sort of the imagination around it. And then the, the the other side of that, though, which is a little harder to fit into that, but is also part of the interest, was that as a teenager, we were talking about this a little bit before the um, the show. Some um, some friends of mine got into this game called Illuminati, um, and these were the friends who are doing all kinds of role playing games and stuff that I, I wasn't particularly into myself. But they said, "No, no, you'll like this one, um, Jesse. It, it's a card game. It's not a role playing game, and it's funny, you know, and it's got all those conspiracy things that you enjoy reading about." And you know, it was genuinely funny. Um, for those who've never seen this game, this came out in the early 1980s, and it had um, you were you got to play one of different uh, several different conspiracies trying to take over the world, and they had you know dental conspiracies and other bizarre things. Um, but it was clearly inspired um, by this book, actually a trilogy, but it had just been reissued in one volume called Illuminatus by Robert Shea and Robert Anton Wilson, which I also read, and so I got interested in. Things like the game Illuminati, the book Illuminatus, the um, the Church of the Subgenius, which was sort of a mock religion with elaborate conspiracy theories, that was also sort of hitting um, popular culture around that time in the in the eighties. Um, and what I in in this book I call the ironic style of conspiracy theories, which is uh, sort of an uh, people who like to play with conspiracy stories, not to believe them and not to debunk them, but to have fun with them. And that has always been part of my uh, sort of interest in the topic as well because – not just because I find it fun but because I think now there's a whole history of people having fun with it and that has in turn influenced the history of conspiracy theories. It's a weird feedback loop. It's, it's, it's a whole set of feedback loops and it's creating an amazing cacophony that's kind of cool to listen to. Would you ever have considered yourself – well, this probably will require defining the term but – would you ever have been a conspiracy theorist as people popularly use? Well, I, I mean, there are conspiracies that I believe exist. I think, and everyone, I, I believe actually that everybody um, who um, in the United States is a conspiracy theorist uh, in in some sense or another. Virtually everybody, not people in comas. Um, <laughs> but we can exempt them from many things. Yes, I, I mean the fact. The fact is, it's there's part of uh, human psychology is that I mean, on the one hand. Um, we are a storytelling, pattern-seeking creature um, uh, and we need to find a way to sort of fill in the gaps with conjecture. And uh, the second uh, basic uh, part of you know, human existence is that we have th things to be afraid of. I mean sometimes they're well-grounded fears and sometimes they're completely absurd but fear is part of human psychology. So if you put our capacity for finding patterns together with our capacity for fear and then you add in the fact that um, – Sometimes conspiracies do exist. Sometimes you have something like the Church Committee, expo or more recently, you know, the NSA revelations, you know, from Snowden. MK Ultra. Yeah, it, it, it's a, it, it. Sometimes you know, there's something genuinely in the. Uh, so that some conspiracies exist. It's not like you keep waiting for uh, vampires to show up. You know, you eventually you realize the vampire stories you're telling might not. <laughs> might not uh, have any truth to them, um, but the uh, but you know periodically conspiracies show up. So you put those three things together. Um, we find patterns. We're afraid of things, and sometimes there's a real conspiracy. Um, people will imagine conspiracies. Um, I've certainly 
um, imagined conspiracies of different kinds. Uh, I mean, I think that micro conspiracies clearly exist. I mean, people around Washington uh, get together uh, in private to plot things. Um, uh, the sort of the big picture conspiracies are almost always untrue. Um, but you know, sometimes a large scale the thing like you know MK Ultra does turn out to be. Uh, I mean, the thing about um, conspiracies in real life is that on one hand, conspiring is part of the human condition. People meet sometimes in secret to accomplish things. But another part of the human condition is failure. I think the vast majority of plots do not actually work out. Um, and this is true on, on the big level too. I mean, like the, the history of the CIA is filled with <laughs> complete failures. I mean part of the exposés of um, the 1970s were all those um, assassination plots against Fidel Castro. And part of, them is, of that story is every single one of them failed, sometimes in just comically incompetent ways. Um, so there's a uh, part of the discourse around con conspiracy theory often has to do with just, um, you know, could, uh, could a group really pull that off? You're imagining something that couldn't happen and sometimes you have to ask yourself, well, no, uh, could a group think it could pull something off whether or not it could actually uh, – and, and I'm sure that, um, you know, I, I mean we mentioned the CIA because I said that earlier but you look at other forms of – Conspiracies that have existed in the real world, you know, Soviet espionage, that sort of thing. Again, it, you know, it, it's full of, of failure as well as successes, and that's the sort of thing that's often left out of the uh, discourse of quote unquote conspiracy theorists because you're not afraid your enemy is going to screw up; you're afraid they're going to succeed. Can we give a definition of yeah. conspiracy theory that ropes it off from, say, just? plots or schemes or whatever else might not quite fit in there. Trevor Burrus Yeah, see, I, I use a very broad definition in this book um, because when people try to narrow it down um, and I've seen lots of attempts, you know, serious scholars trying to say what precisely are we looking at. This often comes up, you know, when you have psychology studies of trying to like find a conspiracy theorizing personality type or something like that and they add all these qualifications that to me don't belong there. Um, and it's a – rather than sort of roping things off from conspiracy theories, I think it's better to make distinctions among conspiracy theories. You know, you could say small or large, plausible or implausible. Um, I will get into some of the distinctions in the book that I get into about, you know, outside or inside, which direction it's coming from. But to me, um, if you've got one or more person – being alleged to – I mean sorry, not more. If you've got more than one person alleged to be acting um, in secret towards an, at some sort of end, that's uh, – that you're talking about a conspiracy. Now, if it's a conspiracy to go out and get lunch, who cares, right? <laughs> but it's uh, – I, I, I try to do this sort of very broad definition for a few reasons. One is that um, one of the categories of conspiracy that I talk about it here is the idea of the benevolent conspiracy and that gets left out a lot because people put in this um, stricture of they've got to be plotting to do something evil or illegal or – but I think that you know these idea of benevolent conspiracies actually influence um, a lot of the evolution of other conspiracy theories. They're part of the picture that you should be looking at. And another reason is that one of the main theses of this book – is that um, conspiracy theorizing is mainstream, not just in the sense that lots of Americans believe a conspiracy killed JFK, but in the sense that there are lots of beliefs that are not categorized as a conspiracy theory while they're popular um, that are in fact conspiracy theories that have the same sort of patterns as the ones that you know go on on the far left or the far right, you know the, the fringes, um, and have to be uh, and and when you look at them. After they're, they're over, people say, oh, yes, the satanic panic of the 1980s and, and 90s, for example, that was a conspiracy panic. But that was very mainstream at the time. You had you know, uh, politicians, uh, prosecutors, juries, you know, mass media outlets embracing this story um, that nowadays sounds like you know, the, some of the fringiest uh, Christian right ideas that are around. And, so, and, and that's – I mean, there's certainly um, things that go on around the discourse around terrorism, around cults, around gangs um, that really should be thought of as conspiracy theories, but usually aren't because so many people embrace them. Well, the difference that's a distinction you draw between because your book is called United States of Paranoia, and if people have heard 
about someone who wrote about paranoia before, famously as Richard Hofstadter right. in the 50s. Now, he had a theory that was about a kind of conspiracy theory and who tends to hold them in the 50s. What's the difference between what he wrote about and, and your thesis? Yeah, so Richard Hofstetter, um, and, and he, he started writing about the, um, the conservative movement in the 50s. His actual um, – his uh, article came out in the early 60s. Actually, interestingly, it began as a lecture that was delivered in London on the day before the Kennedy assassination, <laughs> which it almost feels like a conspiracy <laughs> right there. <laughs> but he thought – he saw um, this as, as something of, of minority movements. I mean, I, not as in like ethnic minorities, but as in you know groups on you know the sides of society that might flare up from time to time, but that it's generally not um, a mainstream phenomenon. And uh, I think that not only that does it apply to the um, to the mainstream, um, but you can see it applying to the Richard Hofstetter audience. I mean, his essay when it was published. In the wake of the assassination, 1964, in Harper's, and then an expanded version in a book in 65, um, in the wake of the assassination, I mean, sort of building towards the assassination, and then even more so after that, there was an ongoing panic in the United States about um, the, about the radical right, the Second Brown Scare, and uh, Hofst a lot of what Hofstadter wrote about the. Um, Psychology of people who you know believe in you know the Illuminati conspiracy of the 1790s or what have you, um, I, I think applies to the folks who were believing these uh, exaggerated stories of a far right um, subversive threat, um, and it applied to his audience in in ways that are more clear now than they were then, um, but which uh, it, it's useful to look at the ways in which. Um, you know, the uh, people were making this critique without thinking about how it might apply to themselves too. Do conspiracy theories say – well, this is one of the big questions I guess of this entire episode but um, – and maybe we have to go through the lists of mm -hmm. conspiracy theories that you have in terms of – because you write about this in the book that, that you're not interested in whether or not they're true. Yeah. I mean I'm interested but that's but, not the but, heart of the yeah, book, right? But it's yeah. about what they say about us right. in particular and the believers and what they say about us. So maybe we can start going through some of these and you can fill us in right. um, on some of your favorite instances. I have some of mine in my question notes. So these, these are the, the five archetypes. The five archetypes. Yes. So yeah. the first one is the enemy outside. Right. And the enemy outside is um, – the uh, conspiracy that's based outside the community's gates. It's out there trying to get in and to transform um, your own community um, or society into something more like it. Um, and the classic example in American history, I mean like the sort of the first primal example would be the fear of Native American conspiracies um, that the uh, colonists had. Now obviously – there were actual sometimes Native American plots to uh, you know attack. They just as there were plots against Native Americans by um, by colonists, but there became also very um, there were also a lot of uh, imagined ones that probably did not exist. And then there were some very elaborate apocalyptic ideas about Satan himself being out there in the wilderness and the Indians worshiping him and uh, and him directing their plots and maybe coordinating with you know other uh, I, I mean it actually kind of coincides with uh, something which falls under a different category which is the Salem witch trials um, so that's the classic example but it also manifests itself you know in terms of fears of uh, the Catholic Church you know being uh, run from the Vatican you know uh, the fear, you know, a lot of Cold War fears of communism. Again, there were spies and so forth, but there were very elaborate additional theories of of communist plots that were not true. Um, it continues today in the war on terror, um, particularly when um, uh, when something like Al Qaeda is imagined as a centralized. Um, uh, conspiracy and octopus with tentacles everywhere. Yeah, that that I, one, that yeah. one in your book, that was my one of my big like aha moments. Was you call? I think you called the myth of the great chief, the super chief, of the yeah. super chief. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. Were, there were Indians, uh, Native Americans who were rallying all the Indians together. Yes, I mean, and this this was a, a um, an idea, idea I borrowed from a, another historian who had sort of pointed to people like you know Geronimo and and King Philip's work, King Philip, who was not really a king, but you know they called. Um, who, who were sort of imagined as having um, much more control than they actually, you know, did in fact have over these attacks and so on, um, and and sort of taking the uh, the I, particularly in the colonial era, there is a tendency to 
um, project the uh, European structures onto the Indians so that a sort of decentralized network of villages were imagined as an empire and one influential Indian as the sort of all-powerful uh, con- you know, plotter behind everything. Um, but you know it, that sort of continues throughout the 19th century, Sitting Bull and, and, and other figures like that. And you know it, it, that ha- continues in the War on Terror too. I mean, there are Al Qaeda, you know, franchises. You know, I, I, the thing about Al Qaeda was there are times when it was centralized, and there are times when it had, um, you know, its uh, it, its fingers in all sorts of different parts of the world. But these tended not to be at the same time. You know, um, I, they tend to they had their screw ups and and, and every same as any other. Po- but there was this tendency to imagine Bin Laden as the super chief who was behind everything. And if you get rid of him, then you could, uh, you know, cut off the the the, uh, the, the snake's head, and everything ends. Um, this projection of us onto them was one of the things that struck me particularly about the Indian related conspiracy theories at the beginning was that there was a symmetry to it because the fear that the colonists had was we've got our settlements um, and there's these outsiders who are trying to come in, destroy what we've got, force you know, disrupt our way of life. Mm-hmm. They're being led or manipulated by a god that is not ours. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 and if people slip away from the Puritan way of life, they will be Indianized and transformed into – Right, which know, is yeah. precisely what the settlers were doing yes. to the Indians. <laughs> uh, and so right. I was – or by the back of my undergraduate English days talking about Orientalism and projecting yeah. the things onto an other that you fear or dislike about yourself. And so is that – does that sort of symmetry play out – Elsewhere is that a, a theme oh, yeah. that runs through it? Yeah, I, and and in fact, um, one theme of the of uh, or I still call it a theme. One sort of recurring um, motif is is uh, moments when you have, and this doesn't just apply to enemy outside stories. Um, uh, two groups looking at one another with paranoid conspiracy theories about one <laughs> another, um, and it's uh, I mean, and that's. I mean, American Revolution. You had uh, the colonists and the and the and the redcoats and the Brits. You know, having their uh, conspiracy theories about one another. And the lead up to the Civil War, um, you had on the one hand uh, uh, Northern fears of the slave power, which and the slave power did not always that phrase did not always apply to conspiracy theories, but it often led to very elaborate ideas about a, a conspiracy of slaveholders. Um, engaging in assassinations and so on, and on the flip side, um, Southerners who are you know constantly afraid of um, slave uh, conspiracies were seeing a northern hand behind a lot of them. Um, well, you do write about that in the very beginning of your book. You mention the the assassination attempt on Andrew Jackson, of which the the gun misfired twice, but there yeah. was twenty years of conspiracy theories behind that in terms of what you were saying, I think, for the slave power, the Yeah, I mean then cursor. people people would cite that as one of their their blows against it. Now in that case, of course, and one thing I talk about in the book is this sort of burst of conspiracy theorizing. I mean, Jackson himself thought that, you know, the senator that he was, you know, at odds with was behind it. Um, this, he, he, the guy who pulled his gun out and it was, if I remember correctly, he, he shot once, it didn't work, and he pulled another gun out. Yeah, and, and it also, and, and, and it was had, point blank. And right? that led some people who are anti Jackson to say, I mean, they, I don't think the phrase false flag attack existed <laughs> back then, but that's what they were accusing him of. They said that Jackson must have hired this guy himself. In order to uh, make himself feel uh, strong, you know, yeah. and, and have have uh, the sympathy for him. Or this so, guy just needs a different gun dealer. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that I think might be a better. Uh, <laughs> and, and this was this was like a, a great story in all sorts of ways because Jackson, you know, this they didn't have you know the Secret Serviceman Jackson himself subdued the guy after both of his guns. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and he had his cane, you know, and these people helping him. So yeah, it, it, it's it's a, it is another example. And and the connection here, you mentioned the. Um, with the Native American myths or the conspiracy theories, uh, and the t- and the tainting, but there's also come with the captivity stories uh, yeah. of women getting captured by, the, especially women. Yeah, not always cap- women. Yeah, and you, and you mentioned that and even with the Catholics, they had captivity stories that the, ca- the Catholics were going to come and kidnap people and take them away to the Vatican and all. Well, yeah, well, there was this idea that people were held against their will and uh, nunneries, you know, and, and there were actually some times, and this actually happened with, you know, Shakers and some of the other. Um, uh, minority religious um, persuasions that people had conspiracy fears of. You would have raiding parties to "quote unquote" liberate people, you know, and yeah, you know, from the the clutches of this cult, you know, and then some people then want to 
go back to but where do, they were quite happy, you know, like little little big man. Is yeah. that does that bleed into then the next one, the enemy within? Because the same, you know, now you're corrupting people, and yeah. now and now those people might come back. Yeah. So if the enemy outside is the is the uh, conspiracy based outside um, the um, the uh, community skates and is an alien conspiracy, um, then the uh, enemy within. Um, the uh, the conspirator is distinguished by the fact that you can't easily distinguish him or himself. That anyone could be a plotter. Um, the great pop culture example is you know Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which you know it's a you may say technically it's enemy outside because they're from outer space, but it's it's the uh, the, the the basic animating fear is is that um, the person next door or even someone in your own family might in fact be not who they say they are or working for some other force. Um, and uh, it, this, of course, is you – know, Salem is the classic example of this. Not only could anyone be um, a witch, but anyone could be converted to a witch. You could be you know, tormented and then like you agree, they'll stop tormenting you if you sign the book. And then you've signed Satan's book and you're a part of the plot. And so it's a – and then how can you um, – Avoid execution. Well, by denouncing someone else, you know, finding someone. Else. So, in terms of like the uh, creation, the sort of social construction of the conspiracy that allegedly exists, you know, that also tends to spread in this way. Um, and that sort of that that that, that kind of fits witchcraft exp, um, uh, accusations in general. But part of what uh, separates Salem and and distinguishes it from you know the sort of general witchcraft accusations that sometimes happened is that it grew out of uh, control. <laughs> I mean under the standard um, procedures in the you know, New England courts um, in the 17th century, someone could accuse someone else of being behind their cow's illness or something like that. But this is difficult to prove in court, right? I mean people believed in witchcraft but they had – um, uh, you know, some some sort of a working tort system. So, and and the tendency of the authorities was to not want this kind of thing to be constantly going on. Um, but with the Salem, um, with the, uh, the 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 what happened in Salem in the in the 1690s was it uh, there was this. Well, one thing was to sort of. Fear of subversion. I mean, this was coming, you know, in, in the in the on the wake of another uh, Indian War and and the fractured society. Um, but you had, uh, and so the state actually sort of got into the um, the business of pointing its fingers and making it much easier. And then it kind of got out of their control, and you started having prominent people being accused, or the, and the wives of prominent people. And that's when you start having some second thoughts coming into the minds of some of the prominent Puritans who had previously been cheering this on. And this is another thing where you can see kind of um, parallels with more recent things. I mean the uh, the um, – if you look oh, – I mentioned earlier the satanic panic of the 80s and early 90s and part of – and actually beyond – larger than that is sort of a, a tendency to see um, uh, child abuse often where uh, there wasn't good evidence for it. Uh, and then one person you know, who had uh, had as a prosecutor down in uh, Florida – um, participated in this was one Janet Reno, um, who then comes up to uh, become Attorney General in Washington D.C. Um, those fears sort of helped feed, you know, her poor decision making, you know, during the Waco raid, and because she saw, thought she was told that um, children were being um, abused at the uh, Mount Carmel uh, compound. Um, but also, then the idea of the um, satanic conspiracy, meanwhile, had leaked into the fringes, so that. Some of the people who are, you know, trying to claim there really were tunnels at the McMartin Day Care Center, and 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 that they that trying to keep those stories alive. You mean well, these stories of like these daycare centers yeah, where, yeah, apparently it, they would have satanic rituals and, and abuse underground these kids. and so yes. on. Yeah, um, we're also, you know, uh, making uh, aiming these uh, accusations at who, you know, Janet Reno. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's just it's very interesting to watch the the way these uh, stories leak into new. Um, into new uh, social contexts or cultural contexts where they're then adapted sometimes to very different uses. And that's part of how these archetypal stories, I guess we've talked about two of them now, kind of evolve is that um, one group gets its hands on it but their needs for that story are different. So the scaffolding, the basic sort of framework of the story may say the same but the villain, um, villain's identity uh, and or goals could change. 
Now, the Red Scare, of course, can be, we have the Crucible is actually, you know, Arthur Miller's The Crucible being a direct parallel, but that would be a classic one. And you, you talk about one of my favorite movies for, um, especially because you mentioned Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And one of the things here is that that was the kind of movie where both the left and the right could say it was about the other side. Right. And then The Manchurian Candidate is another one. And that's a little different because we had the old one, which is a communist one. Mm -hmm. But we also have a new one, which is a corporate one. And so then yeah. again, like the, this idea of – Not nearly as over. memorable. The no, one that no. came out, I, I, I saw it and I wrote a scathing review and I don't remember a whole lot of it now. But um, yeah, and the original novel, The Manchurian Candidate, which came out in the 50s um, uh, by Richard Condon. I mean there's a, there's a number of I – mean, since the man – he's – it's clear Richard Condon despised both communism and McCarthyism. But it's also clear that um, what really got under his skin was manipulation. Um, I mean he had worked in like public relations or advertising. I'm forgetting which one, something like that. And, and that whole sort of um, approach uh, <laughs> to seeing your fellow my, man he, is what he was sort of going after in this. Um, and then putting it in the other skin, and that in itself, you know, can it was one of the sort of uh, conspiracy stories of the day. I mean, like the idea of uh, advertisers being able to brainwash people. Um, that's like they. That's like they live. So, yeah. I mean, that, that well, they live. The you know, 80s. one of the great uh, sort of not exactly body snatchers, but uh, body imposture uh, uh, movies. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So we talk about like the Salem witch trials or the Satanic Panic of the eighties, which are runaway conspiracy theories that then ended. Mm -hmm. So what does the aftermath of these things look like? I mean because our, you know, our kind of stereotypical view of like the conspiracy theorist is the person who's you know, got the dark apartment covered in papers and strings and notes and no matter what happens, everything feeds in and they don't, they don't really kind of break out of this. Um, so the people who were pushing the Salem witch trials say were behind the panic or the people who were saying that the daycare centers had tunnels full of Satanists. Um, when that ends, do they – Repent? Do they repent? Do they say like I was a conspiracy theorist and I'm sorry and it was fake or how do these things fade out? What does well, that I mean, look like? It looks it, – I mean in different ways. I mean in the case of Salem, um, that basically – Basically, ended witchcraft prosecutions in uh, in North America I mean, in what is now the United States. I mean, you can point to incidents here and there, but it's um, there was a real backlash against that, and there was a formal apology. and And I should say, I mean, as bad as that was, um, America's record in this is way better than Europe's. You know, I mean, that was basically a case of America suddenly looking like. What happened, you know, uh, alarmingly frequently in you know Scotland and, and even more so in the, you know in parts of the continent. Um, so there's that, and there's other times when people just sort of have a forgetting. You know, you forgot that this thing happened. Um, the I, I, when I mention the Satanic Panic as an example, people will say, "Oh, I mean, unless they're really young and don't remember it." Um, people will say, "Oh, yeah, that's that's a good example. That was kind of crazy." But that's not something people. I mean, unless they have a loved one who's still in jail, um, that's not something that people usually think about. And um, people may vaguely remember sort of, oh, yeah, people got kind of upset about heavy metal bands in the 80s. You know? <laughs> but it, it's not something that when we talk about the history of the 1980s, it's not usually one of the first things people mention, even though it was a pretty big part of American culture um, at the time. I mean, it's... And uh, one that left a real mark. Um, Dungeons and Dragons too I think was oh, yeah, about the time sure. that got implicated in – Well, I mean there was – there. Tipper Gore wrote a, um, a book called – oh, geez, I think it was like Raising PG Kids in an R Society or something like that. And she had a whole section on uh, – I mean she, of course Tipper Gore is infamous for um, the PMRC, like for the, the whole um, – the, the, the fears parental of parental advisory, right? Yeah. The, the, what was going on in popular music? But she had a whole section on um, role playing games, and she used uh, as a big source like this group called uh, about, "Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons," accusing it of having this occultist, um, these occultist elements, you know. And it's a and, and just basically just mindlessly repeating what this very nutty group um, had had um, was saying. Um, and this is just – I mean this was not a um, 
a book that was sort of treated as like you know the way we would think of something coming from Pat Robertson. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was. I mean, lots of you know sort of culturally hit people didn't like Tipper Gore because of you know they remember you know the hearings with Frank Zappa and so on. You're challenging her, but the fact this sort of became kind of the. Uh, mainstream suburban center-left fear of popular culture. I mean this book was sort of um, the sort of part of, of the moment that people worried about violent video games and so on. And, and it's uh, – I think I'd have to check. Hillary Clinton might have you know, blurbed it or praised it or something. I, I, and it's – it, it was certainly of the, the, the kind of uh, – the part of American life that Hillary Clinton represents you know, in the culture wars. And the fact that it contains this stuff that's – you know sheer vintage 80s satanic panic is pretty interesting. Actually, um, speaking of the parent, the record label thing, I remember the end of the push for having um, a, a, an O label for stuff with the occult. Oh, um, really? Yeah. yeah. So you know, all the Black Sabbath albums would <laughs> yeah, have to be – and that's, of yeah. course, all Tipperware really needed was to listen to the first four Black Sabbath albums and <laughs> she would be cured of what ails her. Yeah. Um, I wanted to move on to the, to the third one, uh, okay. The Enemy Above. Right. So now the next two, I should, The Enemy Above and The Enemy Below, people might sort of recognize there's kind of a directional thing going on. So The Enemy Above um, is what people tend to think of when they hear the phrase conspiracy theory. Um, uh, sometimes mixed with some enemy outside stuff. Uh, but any sort of conspiracy theory that involves, say, the CIA is enemy above. It's sort of powerful institutions, government, large corporations, um, you know, the dominant institutions in society. Um, if it's located in one of those or in some sort of secret society that's allegedly pulling the strings or, you know, or trying to seize power, then it's an enemy above theory. Um, Do you have any particular favorite ones of those that are co quite common? Uh, well, I mean, like I, I mentioned, I mean, like, again, anything with the CIA. Yeah, but like, you know? I mean, any so anything with the CIA. Or, so also, would you consider well, Da Vinci Code kind of stuff? Well, Da Vinci. Let me Rosicrucians or or Lumen, I mean, well, like actually, Mason. That's what you make Mason. Let's hold off on Rosicrucians because okay. they're, they're actually they kind of fit into category five. Except then there's the other. Ver well, we'll get to that. But I, my favorite um, enemy above conspiracy theory is is a little known tract um, called the Declaration of Independence. Um, and in this conspiracy tract, it, it it not only lists all the things that the uh, King of England is doing. Uh, to the colonists but says that it is a design uh, aimed at reducing them to slavery. Um, I mean it, it, it's, it's very clearly conspiratorial um, language and this is of a piece with a, with a lot of the rhetoric um, in um, uh, speeches, pamphlets, correspondence of the American colonists um, in the lead up to and during the uh, uh, American Revolution, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, all these people spoke in conspiratorial terms about what the British were doing to them. That seems to be the kind of one we got for – I mean I feel like the 90s were kind of – with the X-Files and the alien stuff, there was a lot of enemy above kind yeah. of conspiracies going on. Yeah, I think so. And um, you do talk a little bit about aliens in the book and when they factor in a different – I mean so, sometimes with the enemy above and conspiracies with the CIA and things like this. And you also have the body snatchers. But um, I guess I'd be skipping ahead to the benevolent conspiracy of yeah. aliens. Well, should I say something about the enemy below? I mean, yeah, I mean, exactly. if the enemy above is um, the conspiracy of the people who rule, the enemy below is the uh, conspiracy of of those at the bottom of the social ladder trying to subvert and overturn it. Um, the classic examples. Um, or the uh, Southern planters' fear of slave conspiracies. I mean, some people could not see two slaves talking without worrying that they were plotting a rebellion. Um, you look, there are, if you look back at the history of slave rebellions in the South, there are a lot more suppressions of slave rebellions than there are actual slave rebellions because there are a lot of false positives. Uh, and in fact, some, there are some uh, things we're not even quite sure if there really was a slave rebellion or not because we're dependent upon you know the records kept um, by this deeply biased uh, judicial system that the slaveocracy had in place. Um, but I mean, of course, it, there are other uh, uh, other contexts too. Actually, actually one we were talking about um, these sort of changing forms slightly in new, in um, different cultural contexts. Some of the stories told about the. Um, slave rebellion or the uh, alleged slave conspiracies um, in the antebellum era are practically identical to conspiracy stories that were told about 
um, the, you know, the riots in the, the ghettos in the 1960s. Um, and then you look them back to back and I get into this in the book. I mean it, it's clear that you know this is a story structure that really filled a need. Um, How does that structure go? I mean it's, it's a um, – there is at the core of it this um, – Fear of I mean, there's a first the tendency among you know, white racists to imagine blacks as subhuman, particularly when acting together, and sort of imagine them as this zombie mob um, that's going to you know rape and loot and burn. Um, but zombie is an interesting phrase because I just described sort of the modern zombie um, thing, which is you know not a conspiracy fear, more of like a fear of like appetites on autopilot. But the old zombie stories. Um, is they're the mesmerized um, uh, slaves of the master, and often you had enemy below stories combined with enemy um, outside, or even in some sort of odd cases, um, enemy above uh, stories, because you have uh, suspicions of other parts of the United States, and so you would have um, abolition people imagining that abolitionists were behind it because you know they say all oh, these white abolitionists are directing this the, either because they think blacks were too stupid to figure out how to conspire or too happy with their lot uh, if not you know led to this also with you know land pirates you know there are other versions of it and then you know in the 1960s um, you would have some of you know very similar narratives about what you know the looters and so forth were going to do and what they were being promised by communist conspirators by LBJ thought that communist consp- – we're not just talking about the John Birch Society here. You know, Lyndon Johnson was um, pressing um, his attorney general and the uh, FBI to come up with evidence that the communist bloc was behind the riot. So, and uh, so it's – but not only is there these sort of parallels of the broad structures of the stories but even sort of elements of um, – I mean some of the sexual fears, you know, the idea that um, – uh, people were being um, – you know, rebellious slaves were being promised you know, white women uh, for their that, – yeah. That's a constant theme in American you know, and history, it's, yes. And, and, it's, and it's not just like the, the constant sort of fear of you know, the black man raping the white woman, which, but, which is again a big part of you know, American um, racist folklore. But um, this idea of it being promised as a reward, you know, this is going to be part of your, 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 your loot. Um, you know when we've uh, when we've overturned it, and actually I, I mentioned you know sort of the enemy outside being put in there. This is one of those things that people just forget or don't think about because it's so bizarre to conceive of. But in the South in the 1940s, there were rumors that um, you know there were these black clubs that were plotting rebellion that were in league with Hitler, so-called swastika clubs, <laughs> and that Hitler had promised you know the black Southerners control of the South after he won World War II. Now you, what we know about Hitler it's is implausible. the most bizarre, yeah, implausible. <laughs> puts it mildly, but this was a you know this was a rumor um, in the South in the early 1940s, and there was another version where the enemy outside was Japan. Uh, there was another version where it was Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, so, curious about the role that these, it's either categories or archetypes play in conspiracy theorizing. So, is this? These these five categories was this like so there's a whole bunch of conspiracy theories and here's a way to divide them up yeah. or is there something powerful like medically powerful about these five archetypes such that they kind of draw conspiracies to them so that you know we have some sort of conspiracy gets going and then it coalesces towards well, one there's of these no, things. No, I mean, and this kind of gets clear, becomes clear with what I was just saying in terms of combining the enemy below and enemy outside. There are all sorts of overlaps and, and crossbreeding. I mean, this is sort of an, and I'm very explicit about this in the book. I mean, this is sort of a way of organizing on the topic. I, I think that there are stories that kind of attract um, attract uh, new suspicions to them. Um, I mean, stories within these these archetypes, as I was just describing, you know, like with the riot theories resembling the old um, slave conspiracy theories. Um, but it's not that there's this natural tendency towards purity. Like if you've got a mixture of enemy below and enemy uh, outside, it will naturally gravitate towards one or the other. I don't think it works that way at all. Um, and I think that, um, although I do think that there are um, certain sorts of stories that are more likely to be paired, and and also I. Sometimes a story will shift from one archetype to another over time um, as suspicions change. So you had the John Birch Society in the 1950s. 
having an enemy outside story about communism. And even when you have suspicions that Eisenhower is part of it, you know, I mean the headquarters are in Moscow. And this becomes an enemy above story in the 60s. It, it becomes the idea that no, the communists are actually serving um, uh, you know, sort of corporate masters uh, based in the United States and that that's the actual heart of the conspiracy. And then it will then also work in the idea that uh, um, people uh, who are rebelling in the 1960s, you know, the, the student protesters, black protesters and so on, their strings are being pulled um, not by – I mean either – indirectly through the communists or you know, directly through other means by the sort of enemy above. So you have enemy above, enemy outside, enemy below all working together in, in this storyline. But whether it's at its core, an enemy outside story or an enemy above story changes. Um, so these things mutate and develop constantly. Um, and and it, it's uh, – I've sort of created this um, – Organizing principle for you know discussing it, but um, it, it's it's a uh, it, it's oh, what's the phrase? It, 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 it's, ad hoc it, taxonomy to some extent. I I wouldn't say it's ad hoc. Yeah, I, I would say I imperfect would, taxonomy. I, I would say it, it's it's really. I, I try to be very clear that I'm, I'm not discovering something in nature here. I'm, I'm like creating a, a a a way to a way to understand it. There are other legitimate ways of looking at it too. Now the fifth one is uh, we mentioned benevolent conspiracy, which yeah. we mentioned with the Rosicrucians, and I th and also the one with the aliens and mm. um, angels, ali angels or yeah. aliens coming in to fix our environment yeah. with the government, all these kind of ones. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, those? And, and, and this is also another case of, of where um, these things can mutate because there are texts, you know, sort of new age books that are imagined this, that, you know, say that there's a, America has a hidden destiny and, you know, and the Rosicrucians or the angels or whoever are guiding us. And there are then um, Christian right people who will you know take this and say this is you know this is the evil conspiracy. <laughs> and here we have the confessions of the, you know, the people involved with it, or you know people who would look at some of the more heterodox stories about angels and say those are really devils. You know, um, but the heart of the benevolent conspiracy is the idea that uh, you know when people say things like um, everything happens for a reason. Um, they are not necessarily saying that's because the Illuminati is subverting everything. <laughs> They're talking about sort of a hidden benevolent hand moving things. Um, and in sort of a classic American version, you're, someone's talking about God, but there are times when this becomes more than just one supernatural being or or not even necessarily supernatural, but can become extraterrestrial. And uh, and, and that's that's what this whole idea of, of sort of like a benevolent invisible college I, and in that chapter looks at the history of that uh, that concept. So in general, do you do you we've been talking about what we can learn about these, um, mm -hmm. but I guess I'll sort of recapitulate and say Conspiracy theories are everywhere. They're they're constantly at play in American politics. And if that's true, actually, what about libertarian conspiracy theories? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, it, the question is: people have asked me, you know, are libertarians more likely or less likely to believe in you know conspiracy theories? And it, to me, it's it's more the question of libertarian conspiracy theories are much more likely to feature the state because that's who libertarians don't like, you know, or or, or other uh, institutions in collaboration with the state, using the state, you know. So I, I – and when people, people say are libertarians more likely to believe in conspiracy theories, well, they're more likely to believe in anti-government ones and less likely to believe the ones being promoted by the government. I guess that's, I guess that's true but you also see the libertarians who do believe – 9-11 conspiracy. I mean I guess that would be the government doing that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean – Things yeah. along those lines and the preppers and whatnot. Is there a way to recognize a conspiracy theory when we come to it or to take this history and use it to protect ourselves against falling prey to believing in the ones that are going to look pretty silly in 20 <laughs> years? Yeah. I think if you know the history – I mean first of all, if – a story sounds really familiar. Like, everyone must read their, this, this book so that they will know the <laughs> st telltale signs of a false conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean if something really um, sounds like one of those old Indian conspiracy theories you know, or like the, uh, the, the witch hunt uh, conspiracy theories, that's a sign that even if there's a grain of truth there, um, perhaps they're being organized in a, into a narrative that's misleading. So that, for example, um, obviously terrorists were plotting against Americans on 9-11, right? Obviously, you know, Osama bin Laden is, is a party to that. Some people would deny that. I, I think that the 
case for it's pretty pretty strong. Um, but that that doesn't mean we should conceive of those um, conspiracy uh, uh, those conspirators or, or of terrorists in this sort of you know super chief way, um, and that can lead to um, uh, that can lead to just misjudging the situation you're in. Um, and, and and again, things like you know the satanic pan. I mean, if you look at a lot of the rhetoric nowadays around um, you know human trafficking, especially sex trafficking, I, I think that there's this tendency again to imagine these you know criminal enterprises as these sort of vast um, and, and 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 very powerful and centralized institutions. Um, in ways that you know, is very reminiscent of the satanic panic, and I think if nothing else, if if that if you get that twinge of familiarity, that's not going to tell you whether or not any particular person is being trafficked, um, but it's going to help you um, understand like maybe where you should ask further questions. Is there a process to? I mean, some of these. So now we have the internet, or we've had it for a while, but mm -hmm. compared to most of what your book talks about, we we didn't have the internet then, so. So some of these seem like they could just be developed. So the, the satanic panic or the human trafficking stuff could just develop through one group makes a claim. It gets reported by a media outlet without properly vetting their source and then it, those people make the claim and then now people think that a whole bunch of people making the claim means it's probably true and then ABC News reports it. And so, so you could have this – this is just the process of trying to get something – to be a big enough panic that the people who want to change laws about it, like the fundamental Christians who started the satanic panic, uh, that they have to use the strategy to get people to talk about it so they can actually do something about it. So they're trying to sort so of. So you're, you're having a conspiracy theory about the yes. spread of conspiracy. No, 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 no. no. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. There's just there's just like the f one group, like the, you know, whether it's Jerry Falwell's group, they they want to gin up panic about this mm -hmm. and they succeed in doing it. Yeah, I mean I don't think that's how the satanic panic emerged. I mean I, I think the, uh, in that case you had uh, the collision of several anxieties that happened to happen at the same time, a fear of – fears about missing children, um, uh, 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 fears of cults. Um, uh, you know, there was a, a movement to sort of – I mean for a lot of time child abuse had been swept under the rug and, as, and there was a sort of overcorrection where people were sort of saying now they must always – believe anything that comes out of the mouth of a child, even if they've just been in a long session with a sketchy psychotherapist, mm -hmm. you know, who's been, uh, you know, uh, so it, it's a, um, you know, and there, there were a number of sexual anxieties going on at, at the same time. So I don't think that someone deliberately cooked up the satanic panic um, in order to advance an agenda. I think it, it um, but I think that it then happened at a time where stories that were being told in a sort of fringy uh, Christian um, context a decade earlier, um, were now being embraced by the mainstream, and often uh, not even uh, not even by people who knew that a decade earlier someone had been making these claims in this other context. So, looking at our world today, are there things accepted as conventional wisdom right now, or at least not dismissed as conspiracy theories, that you think stand a good chance of being seen as them later? Yeah, I mentioned uh, the sex trafficking. I, th I think a lot of that is going to be um, is going to be looked back in, in, with embarrassment now. I mean, we're having kind of a rerun right now of a lot of the uh, white slavery stories that were told about coerced prostitution a, a century ago, um, and it's actually now we're at this point where, even though I, p even people who are um, susceptible to believing some of the more odd and exaggerated claims about sex trafficking right now um, are, you know, they would look back at the white slavery stuff as well. Of course, that stuff was nuts because it was done in this language of, you know, the progressive era and earlier. But I, I think that's one example. And then broader, I mean, I don't know how long, um, whether this is something that we'll ever sort of recover from, but all of I our discourses around minority religions, you know, and what are get called cults, uh, often fall into this. A, a lot of our discourse around um, around gangs. I mentioned that earlier, but it, it's important. I, I, all sorts of crime stories. People imagine things being 
<laughs> um, organized. I mean, you know, the stuff that gets forwarded to you about, um, you know, the secret symbol. I mean, a gang initiations and so there's this sort of very pulpy imagination that gets imposed on. Obviously, crime is real and gangs are real, but you know they don't all look like um, this movie that you saw, you know, when you were 17 or whatever. Um, but I, that's been so current. I don't know if we'll ever get past it. Um, and then with terrorism, um, you know, I don't think fear of terrorism itself is going to go away because terrorism is, is going to. But it, you know, we'll, we'll eventually. There's always going to be some sorts of terrorism, but. I think that some of the more specific fears that um, are going through the um, American culture right now um, may be viewed in the future the way we now look back at you know the stories told about Japanese Americans during World War II, that sort of thing. So is there any indication that conspiracy theories might be getting worse? One reason I think they maybe could be, for example, is that we're walling ourselves off in different media outlets. So we might need conspiracy theories to explain the other side because we rarely interact with it, for example, um, just the internet in general. Are they getting more common? Are they getting worse? Uh, things gonna, is this a problem if that's true? I, I think uh, there's actually a really interesting study that was done recently. Joe Usinski and, and Joe Parent, a couple of um, political scientists, um, took this enormous sample of letters from the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune, mostly the New York Times, but they used the Tribune sort of as a control group to make sure that the time, they weren't getting a something that was just like the liberal Times audience, you know, or or, or relatively liberal coastal Times audience. And and they um, going back uh, more than a century, and they just basically looked at all the letters to the editor and coded, you know, like uh, which ones made conspiratorial claims, and. It was – there were a couple of really big spikes in the 1890s around uh, people talking about corporate trusts in the 1950s, the Cold War communist fears. And there's some smaller spikes around things like Watergate. But over time, basically, um, there – it tended to be pretty constant and actually slightly declining. Um, now, there are obvious follow-up questions like you know, to what extent did things then move to talk radio or the internet and so forth. But this is like the most complete sort of study that I've seen someone do and it um, reinforces my general gut feeling which is that no, it's not more common now. The internet has changed the way conspiracy theories are generated and spread. Um, I think you know the conspiracy news cycle has sped up along with all the rest of the news cycle. I think um, that it's now – a lot of conspiracy theories that previously would be limited to particular subcultures are now much more um, visible to outsiders. So that when I mentioned you know the swastika club story earlier, we know about that because a sociologist went out and interviewed a bunch of people. Um, but now you can watch things get posted on Facebook page, and not only does that make it more visible, but it also means there's more um, cross pollination. Um, you might have a conspiracy forum where people who probably would not talk about this in real life might encounter and trade stories, and 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 so you have you know hippies, black nationalists, UFO buffs, uh, militiamen, you know taking what they want from other people's stories and working. So there's so there's this all changes the way conspiracy stories are told, but it doesn't necessarily make them more common. And when you also add in the question, the fact that. Um, Yes, conspiracy stories can travel quickly on the and far on the internet. So can debunking. It's not immediately obvious. Um, I mentioned Joe Yusinski. He actually thinks that debunking might uh, be winning that particular race. Um, he's writing a paper. It's not out yet. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's not immediately obvious that uh, one is going to pull ahead of the other. So what we have now is not so much like a new paranoid era as this is the particular paranoia of 2016. Um, it, most people have not looked at this history and most people tend to forget the things that they found quite compelling, you know, 15, 25, 35 years earlier. So they forget, you know, or, or, they, or they don't know about it or they just sort of pass over um, the fears of earlier eras. But people have always had things to be afraid of and I imagine they always will. Thank you for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.